I understand it was Terrence McKenna who said, you got to have a plan or you're going to be a part of someone else's. We can choose to go through life with an identity that is aligned with the highest value system in our hearts. And then we can always verify if we're on track or not. Or we can go through life not knowing what our values are, what identity we're pursuing, or what our purpose is. In those cases, we can easily fall victim to doing what someone else is bidding for them through simply living our lifestyle. It can be devastating to our true loving identity as a human animal, though, to see the vast consequences of the plans others execute in which we are the pawn. A wake-up call to get conscious and take responsibility for what our identity is at the essence of our being and what identity we put forth for the public to observe. This concept of identity, it seems like one of the most impactful social topics we could dissect and comprehend. And it's also so vast and nuanced that it can be a challenge to get our heads around it fully. Identity can stick to us like glue and be nearly impossible to shake in some cases. In others, it evolves and changes throughout our lives. Sometimes we can harness the power of our will to alter our identity intentionally in order to better align in some way with one another, with our goals, or simply our heart's intuitive value system, which we can so easily be programmed from an early age to ignore or not even be able to hear at all through the cacophony of things ringing in our heads that we were taught to fear. Our identities can serve to unite or divide us and help us or hurt us, depending on how others perceive them, and even how we perceive them ourselves. Getting to know the dynamics of identity and how we use it, both for ourselves and in evaluating others, can be a really valuable tool to use in our effort to improve the harmony of our socialization, as well as our personal success and comfort in life. Perhaps evaluating things through the lens of identity and learning to be more flexible with the way we embody and represent them, as well as judge others over their identities, could even be the key to nurturing a widely encompassing unification of us all. Maybe using that as a tool for our collective growth, we can at last agree to share the vast resources of our precious planet to our mutual benefit and actually have a chance to thrive together as the one massive, nearly 8 billion strong member human family that we actually are. I believe that identity is so powerful and influential in our lives and in the choices we make because it feeds one of our core motivations as a human being. Since we are an ultra-social creature, our mindset and our brain chemistry, guided by deep, ancient programming in our DNA, orients us toward bonding with other humans. I do this a lot, talking about identity. <laughs> identity markers are the data points that we observe in people whether they're appearance related, based on behavior we witness, or even simply the type of people with whom we see them socializing, that help us determine who is in our tribe and who's not, who we can trust and who we can't, who we would consider for an intimacy partner, who seems cool to do activities or just hang with, and who reveals traits which we were conditioned to see as warning signs to avoid those types of people. Then, once we've assessed these observations, they serve to either be unifying and attract us to the person, or polarizing and repel us away from them. Some things those who judge us observe are within our control, like our good deeds, our accomplishments, and with whom we choose to associate. Others came to us through our upbringing or our culture, like our religion, our beliefs, and many of our preferences. Some are embedded in our public-facing persona and are more difficult to hide, like our appearance, the people by whom we surround ourselves, and our name itself. Yet others, like sexuality and beliefs, we can shield from other people witnessing and therefore using to judge us. The problem with observing what we deem to be negative identity markers in others is that they get imprinted on our brains, which happens to allow future access when faced with similar scenarios. 
But the images of those memories are stored in neurons that attach to so many networks that will then trigger fears learned previously in life when we come across them again. This is the mechanism that we're up against. It takes literally a reprogramming of the neural networks in our minds to orient ourselves to a new way of being, one that supports our mutual thriving. Since we're an ultra-social animal, believing others think highly of us relates to a deep need to belong that's encoded in what it means to be human. One way this manifests is that we all want to be validated. We all want to walk into a room and have people excited to see us, right? When we're met with dread or resentment, it hurts. And the tricky part about identity markers is that they often determine whether someone is excited to see us or resentful of our presence. The ultimate version sounding something like, get away from me, I don't want to be around you, which represents shunning, the ultimate rejection, surely one of our biggest fears. Therefore, our subconscious minds take on the task of getting this need to belong met. Thoughts, words, and actions that we don't necessarily consciously choose will approach social pursuits on our behalf with a mind of their own, so to speak, by magnifying the traits that we, i.e. the subconscious mind, think will attract others to us and garner respect, and concealing those we fear will trigger some level of rejection or disrespect from them. Unless we're looking for a fight. <laughs> So as with countless other creatures on Earth, fear is the mechanism that literally enables us to survive. So the sensitivity of our nervous system to potential danger is standard operating procedure from, from the more primitive parts of our brains. One big challenge we face is that times have changed dramatically and very quickly in relation to our existence as a species. And our DNA doesn't necessarily give us what we need to survive in today's world. There was a time when our knowledge of which snake was poisonous or which large cat or bear we could not outrun was needed to save our lives. Now, our dangers walk on two legs and only have subtle differences in appearance sometimes, leaving us with a complicated set of data points to evaluate in order to sort out who's a threat and who's safe. Identity markers are one big way we do this. So I want to make a very bold and important statement at this juncture, and this relates to the nature I was referring to earlier. I believe that the source of so many of our problems, especially in the United States, is this. We are an interdependent tribal animal living in a self-reliant, individualized world that separates what would otherwise be integrated families and tribes. The production of goods that we use and our consumption of them are also largely detached, often by the span of countries and oceans. This leaves whole societies full of complex layers, like a chasm between all of us, as well as ourselves and the source of things we use on a daily basis. These circumstances leave us quite detached from those sources and the whole process. So our concepts of production, distribution, and waste are dramatically skewed. Not to mention our ignorance or blind eye to the true cost and the toll that the things we consume take on resources, human lives, and our planet. Another aspect of this challenge we face is that for so many people, the only survival skill we need is how to acquire money to buy things rather than how to harness nature for our survival. This can leave us quite detached from nature itself, resulting in a lack of understanding, respect, and reverence for the thing that actually provides and sustains all of our lives. You know, it's devastating to acknowledge that people can identify hundreds of company logos. And maybe if they're lucky, a handful of edible plants that would keep them alive in the wild. At their most useful, identity markers can help illuminate where we're connected and where we're detached.
from one another, from the system that runs our socialized world, and most sadly, nature itself. Despite the fact that we are in no way separate from this thing we externalize by calling nature as if it's over there, outside somewhere. Can you believe that we live in a culture that teaches us to look at tree huggers as freaks? What, freaks of nature? <laughs> um, I think we're all that, aren't we? <laughs> so who are we anyway? And who are we? I mean, to others and out in the world, the public eye. And what determines that? Are we what we look like? Tall guy, blonde lady, Asian child, person of color? Are we where we're from? American, Chinese, Mexican, Parisian? Are we our wealth status? Filthy rich, dirt poor, upper middle class? Are we our preferences? Rocker dude, sports fan, sci-fi trekkie? In effect, we're a complex combination of many things, a quotient, if you will, of many things, <laughs> any of which could be used to judge us at any time. People will use them to determine whether we get included or excluded in social situations, whether we get jobs or not, and in some case, even our very survival. Some aspects of our identity we put forth intentionally, some we do only subconsciously and may not even be aware of, or even if we are aware, powerless to stop. I can't help being a jerk sometimes. <laughs> and some are imposed upon us from external forces beyond our control, especially before we're old enough to realize that habits and identities that will stick with us for up to our entire lifetimes are being embedded in our internal psyche and our external image. Identity markers are generally in the eye of the beholder. Even if we think we're identifying with certain traits and representing a certain group, if we're mistaken for something else, then that's what the person's going to react to, not necessarily what we wanted them to. We learned a concept in screenwriting class called distinct reactions. So, for example, someone shows up identifying as a tattooed individual by revealing exposed tattoos in public. One person's going to think, oh my god, he's so gorgeous, look at those cool tattoos. While someone else will be thinking, oh God, look at those tattoos. This guy's probably a criminal. I better avoid him. Well, I've exposed my tattoos before, so maybe people have said both about me. <laughs> and these distinct reactions, they can change for the individual over time. As our personalities and thinking evolve throughout our lives. My dad literally said to me as a young adult when he first saw my tattoos, only an idiot would mark up their body like that. Ouch, right? <laughs> Dad, the one guy from whom I need the most approval, thanks. Fortunately, though, I am happy to report that I've garnered so much respect for my father in the meantime, he now says that my ink is the only ink with which he's okay. <laughs> because we have such complex and involved lives, which are largely oriented towards achieving success and are made stressful by time limitations, we often don't make room to stop and make detailed observations about others, or of course ourselves. Therefore, <clears throat> we do a certain amount of generalizing when sizing one another up, which causes us to ignore countless other factors about the person being identified when we're making our judgments of them. We evaluate identity markers we witness in order to determine interest and potential compatibility in a way that seems relevant to us, depending on our motives, which may be, again, about friendship, love interests, social opportunities, potential business associations, etc. In effect, we're making the most rapid and efficient determinations that we can, without, of course, thinking about it. But the potential cost of rushing these assessments and not looking deeply enough or just being wrong is that we may prematurely write people off and miss opportunities for friendship, love, and business partnerships. Or we may misread others, trust them more than they actually deserve, and be set up to be taken advantage of. So we also make assessments about our own identity markers, both the internally focused ones as well as the externally exhibited ones. These generally serve to make us feel pride when we judge attributes or behaviors as positive, like accomplishments, or shame when we feel they're negative, like falling off the proverbial wagon or making some big mistake, especially that other people notice. 
They also continually influence our decisions about what to reveal and what to conceal publicly in an effort to get what we want out of life, socially, and who we want to be in the world according to our own value system and our purpose. We can, of course, adjust our image and behavior accordingly and seek to contrive what we want to present to the world in an effort to garner positive responses from people. Or sometimes we even do it for negative ones. Pink mohawk, anyone? <laughs> We can tend to be hard on ourselves when we make a mistake or fail to meet the expectations that we set for ourselves or that others set for us. How about the difference between the way we identify ourselves to ourselves when we're in our best and our worst emotional states? At our best, we totally blew them away or we rocked that one. Or, I don't know how we do it, but we're sure grateful things tend to work out for us. On the other hand, we can fall victim to self-identification along the lines of, oh, I'm such an idiot. I will never get this right. Or I know I'm going to mess this up. Well, I'd like to propose that before we call ourselves an idiot or a loser, we give ourselves a break and simply call it a learning opportunity. We know we need a certain amount of time to perfect anything we do. So why waste precious learning time by allowing ourselves to wallow in frustration? Switch the emotion and switch the mind. Some of the most amusing identity markers are style items, like someone's car or their dog or maybe a trademark hat or something. Do you ever see those hyper-masculine bodybuilder dudes and they got a fluffy little white French poodle walking alongside them? <laughs> or how about the conservative professional lawyer in a suit type woman and she's got a big pit bull at the end of her leash? Same goes with the dainty granny in a muscle car and vice versa, the cool looking dude in a Pinto. <laughs> Sometimes our identity is in conflict with other aspects of ourselves. Imagine growing up in a conservative political environment and learning to believe all the values that go along with that. Then you discover later in life that you're gay and realize that your people are totally against you from the core of who you never knew yourself to be. So which one are you? How do you know whether to love or hate yourself? How we criticize other people is often indicative of how we feel around them or how we gravitate toward them or avoid them. This, of course, also spills into other people we influence with these feelings. If we think someone is mean or rude or abusive, we're probably going to avoid them and warn others to do the same. One of the main reasons that animals use language is to warn other members of their species or tribe about potential dangers. The vervet monkeys have 20 barks, all indicating, indicating a different looming threat. Do you know anyone who identifies as a victim? How about a bully? A know-it-all? Well, in my own mind, I've been all three. And yet, do you want to know why I'm so happy? Because I know how to consult with my inner child and ask him who he wants to be. Then when I make that what identity with, I get to play my way right through life. Those are the kind of powerful choices that can transform us and motivate us into a higher state of being with ourselves, with one another, and with our environment. Here's a question we can ask ourselves. Do our identity markers have to own us? Meaning, is it worth clinging to identity markers that we know will not serve us socially when they are ones we have the power to conceal? And should we be doing the cost-benefit analysis when we determine which ones to flaunt in view of others? When we suffer the consequences of identity markers being exposed that we could have kept under wraps, we could ask ourselves if it was worth it. As with anything in life, finding the balance is a good place for which to strive. We can always do the cost-benefit analysis. If the cost is the risk of being ostracized or even the recipient of violence, then we should determine if the benefit outweighs that. Perhaps identifying in that way holds enough value to us to make it worth enduring those consequences. We can also ask ourselves what aspect of us is clinging to the particular identity marker. We can then work to explore and discover the sweet spot between ego wanting to be validated and being accepted for exactly who we feel ourselves to be and not triggering others with something they were conditioned to resent, revile, or disdain, and even lash out at. When I was first in college at age 18, 
I went to school in San Francisco, and I basked in the liberty I thought I had to express myself freely and publicly as a homosexual. Imagine the shock when I was tripped and had my wrist broken in what I will with no hesitation declare a hate crime. I remember saying to the guy, you just don't like gay people, to which he replied, I'm okay with gay people. I hate faggots. So was I a gay person, a faggot, a flamboyant personality? What triggered him and why? Surely it's the conditioning we get from our society, our parents, our peers, the media we consume, etc. And it's all baked in, often following us throughout our lives. We mostly don't even know where our reactions come from, nor are we conditioned to stop and consider the impact that our reactions have versus who we really want to be in the world. Realizing that, I started taking more responsibility for my own outward-facing image. I could actually thank Rob Fontes for that lesson. So I compromised a bit of, of what my ego thought was my identity and my right to free expression, and I toned down my personality, my behavior, and my flamboyance. And I take it on as a value that I want to uphold to be responsible for what I emit in the world and that I make a conscious effort when possible to choose things to say and do that have the highest likelihood of being met with a positive reaction in the recipient. In so many cases, if we can muster the influence over our minds and make these conscious choices about how we show up in the world, we can hedge ourselves into a position of being liked, respected, welcomed, and perhaps even be a positive influence on others. Being ultra-social animals with strong needs for validation and to feel that we're making a contribution to the tribe and to others, who wouldn't want that? I'd like to propose a few potentially really valuable uses of identity. We can determine before entering a situation or even while already in it, who we want to be to the other people with whom we're interacting. Are we going to be a leader or a follower? Are we the ones giving information or receiving information? Are we here to talk, share, or are we here to listen, receive? Are we supporting? Are we getting supported? Need we identify as a victim and dump our drama on someone else? Or could we simply be someone seeking constructive support from a trusted confidant? And lastly, I'd like to address a very seldom talked about and likely a very misunderstood or yet to be understood aspect of identity that we already face and may be going off the cliff soon. We already have exponentially increased the impact of our identities through social media. We now need to ask ourselves, individually and collectively, if we are going to maintain our own natural human identities or give them over to the machine. We've already gone from desktop devices to pocket devices to wearable devices and even some medically embedded, embedded ones. How deeply will we have gone once we decide to connect the chip directly to our brains? And what if that decision is made for us, either by physical force, coercion, or just social pressure? So ultimately, the question there is, will we still have a human identity? once we've merged with the machine. 